Great. Well, welcome everyone to um, our Immersed UK fireside chat with Jeremy Dalton from PwC. Um, Jeremy is the head of PwC's XR team, for those of you who don't know. He helps his clients to understand, quantify, and implement the benefits of XR. He has worked with organizations across multiple industries. He's given talks around uh, immersive tech all over the world, and he's published books on the topic, including his new book, Reality Check, How Immersive Technologies Can Transform Your Business, which will be released in January. Um, he's also been featured in media all over the all over the world, including BBC, The Independent, The Guardian, and we're very, very lucky to have him as uh, one of our members of the Immerse UK Founder Advisory Board. So thank you very much, Jeremy, for joining us today. Um, today Pleasure we're to be here. Yeah, great. And today we're going to be talking about the immersive tech landscape, how UK organizations are using XR and where we're seeing the biggest impact. Jeremy's going to start off with a short presentation and then we'll go straight to discussion and Q&A. We want to keep this really as chill and open as possible. So please do get involved. Um, raise your hand if you have a question or drop your question in the, the chat box and, and we'll get to it. So Jeremy, I will hand it to you to start with your presentation. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for that, Asha. So you should see a presentation appearing on the screen any second now. Is that, uh, is that appearing for you all? Yeah, all good with that? All good. Fantastic. So there's, there's a lot of different material we could potentially cover. So I'm going to skim over some of the analyses, reports, studies that we've been involved in over the last uh, few years relating to XR technology in particular uh, around uh, the UK impact. And um, I'm more than happy to, to take this conversation in a direction that you want to go. So feel free at any point during the presentation, this, this initial bit to interrupt me. I have no problem with that. If you want to go uh, unmute yourself and, uh, and say something or ask for clarification, um, or if you want to put something in the chat window, you know, I can see stuff popping up in, in chat as well. You know, that's absolutely fine too. So uh, thank you all for listening. I will kick off now by talking about an analysis that we did a while back. It was actually in 2017. And this, this was an interactive map of the UK that we put online in collaboration with Immerse UK and Digital Catapult. So we wanted to try and understand what the XR landscape was like in the UK back then, but from a vendor perspective. So in other words, you know, uh, from, the, from the supply side of XR technology, who, what are all the startups doing? Where are they based? Are they a content supplier, a technology supplier, or a service su supplier of VRAR tech? And how established were they, you know, from uh, micro companies to startup companies, to scale ups, to established organizations? And you can see a screenshot there of, of the analysis. It's been superseded now by a lot of other uh, a lot of other data, but this is where it all it all kicked off. Um, and I'm glad to say that um, Immerse UK's uh, latest analyses show that we've moved on uh, quite tremendously from 463 identified VRAR companies to well over a thousand now in the UK, which is absolutely fantastic. But that's the supply side. What about the demand side, which is arguably even more important from the perspective of understanding what do businesses want and what proves that virtual reality and augmented reality is valuable for businesses? We released a report in June this year around the effectiveness of virtual reality for soft skills training in the enterprise. And uh, you can read more about it on, on PwC's uh, site. I'll give you the, um, uh, the URL in a second. In fact, I'll drop it in now so you have it uh, if you want to reference it. That gives you all the details there if you want to check it out. But this is the executive summary of that study. We basically had uh, an, an e-learning program and a classroom program related to inclusive leadership training going on in PwC. And we said, well, this is a fantastic base to then use that content and create virtual reality, cont uh, virtual reality inclusive leadership module that, sat, that sits alongside the e-learning and classroom side of things so that we can then analyze as, as equally as possible, what are the differences we're seeing between those three modalities? And we found that virtual reality learners were four times faster to train in VR than in the classroom, 275% more confident to apply what they learned after the training, 
much greater emotional content, emotional connection to the content, four times more focused in VR than e-learning, and even more cost effective at scale. Now, this last point is particularly important because, as you might expect, virtual reality is expensive at the beginning. So what you're seeing here is a graph of uh, number of learners on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the cost per learner. Um, and then in pink, you've got virtual reality. In yellow, you've got uh, e-learning. And in gray, you've got classroom. So at the very beginning, virtual reality is far more expensive than e-learning and classroom, particularly for a small number of learners. We're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40. Once you start reaching 100, 250, 300, 400, the gap really starts to close. And at 375 learners, it actually achieves cost parity with the class with classroom training. Um, and at 1,950 learners, VR training ach achieves cost parity with e-learning. E and that's cost on a cost per learner basis. Remember that. Um, but yeah, there are lots of details behind this and the methodology, and you can check it all out um, on the website if you want. But this report and the study that's that's come out of it has been doing the rounds in the industry um, and is, is quite effective at trying to articulate the value of virtual reality in this particular use case for soft skills training. So that's looking at one particular area, but what about the bigger picture, the macro picture? We produced the report in collaboration with our economics team here in PwC London, and we wanted to try and answer the question, of what, how does this contribute like on a, global, on a global scale, on a more macro scale? And we found through a lot of modeling of different data sets and an understanding of where XR could help boost productivity, we found that um, XR could potentially boost GDP by up to one and a half trillion dollars by 2030, uh, which is absolutely incredible for, from where it was back in November 2019. So just a year ago when we first released this uh, Seeing is Believing report um, at $46 billion. And again, if you want to see the, the detail behind this, if you want to play with the data set, all that sort of stuff, that's available on PwC's website for free. Uh, you don't have to sign up to anything or give your email address or anything like that. This is how we split it up. We split it up into five main buckets in terms of this analysis. And this is how, uh, this is, these are the quantities of the numbers that it ended up contributing to that one and a half trillion dollar number. And I can go into more detail on any of these if anyone's interested, um, but I'll leave it for you to look at for a little bit for now. And then, you know, you can mention on chat if you want to dig into a certain area or even in the Q&A afterwards, um, you can have we can have a chat about any of these areas in particular. A lot of people were curious about the split between virtual reality and augmented reality. And according to our analysis, this is what it's looking like in terms of our prediction of where it's going. So there's always going to be a chasm between augmented realities, boost to GDP and virtual realities with augmented reality taking a lead, an ever widening lead to 2030. Now, a lot of people mistake this for saying that augmented reality is the more important technology or is the more significant technology. That's not true at all. Actually, augmented reality is, uh, is incredibly important and so is virtual reality and the two rarely intersect in terms of what their applications are. But the reason why we see augmented reality taking more of, the, uh, more of the, the boost here is for two reasons. One, the technology is very quickly becoming a default part of the technology that we take around in our pockets every day, the mobile phone. And second of all, when it comes to applications, there are more applications in the real world than there are applications related to a virtual world. That doesn't mean virtual world applications are no good. It just means that there are more of them than AR, which is why it's contributing a larger number. And then we have a split which looks at a number of select territories. Key summaries here is that we expect the US to take the, uh, the biggest uh, or make the biggest contribution at over half a billion dollars by 2030. Uh, East Asia coming in second place. And then Europe with some key players like uh, the UK and Germany uh, coming in uh, third place there. And uh, we've also have some analysis on the number of jobs that are enhanced by XR, but you can get all those details on the website as well. So that's looking into the future. What is the potential outlook for this technology? 
But what about the present? Right now, who is using XR in industry? To answer this question, we scraped 7.2 million UK and US businesses for publicly available data on what, how they were using XR. And uh, it's basically done through a natural language processing algorithm and specific keywords that are picked up. So things like immersive technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, XR, VR, AR, mixed reality, uh, all of that was brought in and then analyzed line by line pretty much by by our team which took a long time they, we didn't analyze 7.2 million line by line it got into a much smaller short list uh, by the by the time it reached us but uh, the public uh, the publicly available data came from uh, organizations news uh, news sites their blogs their social media postings uh, their press releases all that sort of stuff and we connected every example we could find to an industry a geography, a technology, and a use case or application. From a technology perspective, we looked at VR versus AR applications. From a geography perspective, we split it. Uh, we split it by uh, the UK regions, and uh, from and we also have uh, the US data as well. Uh, and we analysed um, all US states uh, within that. From an industry perspective, you can see the list here um, of how we cut it. And then from an application or use case perspective, uh, this is the list over here. Uh, now I can dig further into that data and we can chat about it maybe when, uh, when we're having a bit more of a chat about it, but I'll show you the, the data that actually sits behind this uh, in more of an accessible format. You can actually start exploring the UK version of this data right now. Um, and that's available here just providing it in your chat window. It's pwc.co.uk slash XR and industry. Um, but this is an executive summary effectively. So when it comes to technology, virtual reality currently accounts for much more than augmented reality, interestingly, which is in contrast to what you saw on the seeing is believing report. Now, part of the reason I believe that is, is because VR is in a more mature state than augmented reality. And uh, there is more than therefore there is more people talking about it, more people that are being vocal about it, and therefore it's being drawn into this analysis more. But quite significant, it's, it's pretty much two thirds virtual reality and one third a little bit more uh, in the US uh, for augmented reality. From a location perspective, uh, looking at all the, the examples that we analyzed, we found that one third of every XR example of, of usage in the, of commercial usage in the UK is based in, in London, or is let's say more accurately connected to a company that is based in London. Um, and, but alternatively, another way of putting that is two thirds of XR activity is located in the regions outside of London. So this is brilliant because there's actually a, a fantastic split of how we're seeing virtual reality and augmented reality, and it's happening all over the UK and not only in London, which remains a, a key hub alongside other cities in the UK. In the States, um, instead, of, instead of giving you a pie chart, which was cut into loads of different smaller pieces, uh, we filtered it by states where, there's, where we're seeing more than 4% uh, of the, the number of applications um, involved in, uh, or sorry, the state represents more than 4% when you, when you cut it uh, by number of applications of XR. So we've only included those states here on this list. And um, you can see California, very similar to, uh, uh, to London, it accounts for about a third of all the XR activity in the UK, uh, closely followed by, or maybe not that closely, it's, it's down by about 12%, 13%. Uh, the next higher up um, uh, state is New York. And then you've got a few states which are almost equal uh, behind that, Texas, Illinois, Florida, Massachusetts, and, and Virginia, in fact. I think the other thing to note from this analysis is that uh, based on all that scraping, we, we found specific examples of nearly 1,600 applications of XR in the UK and 2,200 in the US. Now that means, what is that, 3,000, over 3,700, nearly 4,000 applications basically. And I think that is absolutely fantastic because that is a minimum number. That is the smallest 
number possible because this is this only takes into account where someone is talking about it. If anyone is doing anything and not talking about it publicly that this algorithm was able to scrape, then that's not included in this data. So it's safe to say that those nearly 4,000 examples um, is a minimum number. In terms of industry usage, we've got uh, UK and US usage, uh, UK at the top, US at the bottom, but engineering and manufacturing is the real key industry here. In the UK, it accounts for almost a quarter of all usage in this analysis. In the US, it's, it's closer to one in five, but still very significant beyond the next uh, highest tier, which in the UK is retail and consumer, and in the US is, in, uh, is the technology industry. And then finally, looking at it from an application perspective, I think this jumps out at you very quickly. So UK on the top, US on the bottom, 38% of applications relating to consumer engagement. So this is interesting because consumer engagement applications are particularly helpful, especially now during COVID-19, but even beyond COVID, where you're able to work with different, um, you're able to bring to life products for different consumers around the world. Uh, such as you know the IKEA application, such as um, in fact I have a I have an application which I can talk about. I'll quickly jump between this. Let's see. This is actually um, a print copy of of Reality Check, the book that's coming out in January that Asher mentioned. Uh, this is an example of an of an augmented reality try on application from a British German company called Viking. And um, a, they're, they're using it uh, or they're selling it to a Chinese uh, sneaker company called Poison. And you can see here the screenshot. You've got their, their mobile app on the left hand side and you've got a screenshot of their the shoes being digitally inserted onto the individual uh, on the right hand side. And that's a fantastic way of, of engaging with consumers. That represents this large piece of the, the pie here. Learning and development is the next biggest area. Um, in the US, it's actually the first biggest area. In the UK, it's the second. And that relates not only to soft skills training that we talked about uh, previously, but also related also relates to job skill simulation. So the idea of using your, your hands to actually perform actions within virtual reality. I can see mate has got a question now, actually. He's, uh, he's asking, what is the difference between consumer engagement and entertainment? So by entertainment, Matty, I'd say uh, this is relating to a company using, um, it could be a VR arcade. Uh, so they're, they're selling consumer experiences um, that are fun, um, that, are, that are used in your leisure time. Uh, it could be you know, gaming related um, from a definitions perspective by consumer engagement. I would mean a tool that is used by an organization to achieve a business objective like selling more products, but is not related to, uh, to leisure time or fun time or anything like that. So the example that I just gave um, uh, is, is a good one around uh, Poison obviously wants to try and sell more, sho more shoes, but individuals are worried about how it's gonna look, but to look on them. So they're using this as a way to engage with the product without having to physically go to the, uh, to the store and put it on. So this is worth mentioning and uh, we can have a chat about it more if you want. Um, Innovate UK actually releases a lot of data uh, relating to their, their funding. Okay, we've got to wait for it to reload. Um, this actually, I need to give some credit to Rab Scott for pointing me in this direction. So Rab is, is working in the, uh, the AMRC at the University of Sheffield um, and is also uh, part of the Immerse UK um, advisory board as well. But um, he pointed us to this, uh, this Innovate UK publicly available data, which looks at the, the amount of funding that has been given by the UK government effectively through Innovate UK uh, across different technologies to different enterprise types and sectors. And they now have a, uh, uh, another checkbox as to whether it's COVID related or not. But you can see here that the total number of grants sit at 458 million. If I if I uh, keep virtual reality only in that, we can see how it changes there. So we can see there 60 million pounds provided by Innovate UK across 
452 participants. And you can even go by year here. So this is 2020, 2021. That's 2019, 2020, it'll pop up in a second. 2018, 20, 2019. And actually I should not show history, probably make it a little bit more accurate. So this is including now just that year. So 2018, 2019, uh, 2019, 2020, and then 2020, 2021. And there's a lot of detail behind this that you can dig into uh, to see which organizations uh, have been given the funding, uh, how much they've been given. If you put your mouse over it for what purposes, uh, all this sort of stuff. Um, this is all publicly available data. The only thing that we've done is made it uh, brought it into this this visualization for everyone to uh, to check out. So if anyone's interested in that, we can dig into that, um, you know, at uh, in the Q and A or during the the chat. We've also got some details here relating to different so, sectors, small, medium, large. I'm just going to ask really quick, Jeremy. Does it say like yeah. funded, like uh, if it was haptics or what or what what it was? Or was um, we. It says only to the extent that we have access to that in the description. So you can see here, for example, um, this is something that was given to 3D Repo Limited uh, through, I think, Visualize, the, the uh, VR agency based in the UK. And you can see they're, they're developing a single environment integrated data visualization analytics capability here. Um, so you can get that information from there. But in terms of being able to sort by haptics, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. We can only sort by sector um, and the program and the year uh, at the moment and the enterprise type. Okay. So yeah, uh, that's um, a lot of different material for you all uh, that will hopefully kickstart a conversation. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to chat about uh, any of this stuff in, in any bigger, any, any larger detail. You've got here the website, uh, how UK organizations are using XR and you can access this right now uh, and you can look at stuff by region you can look at stuff by uh, industry um, and you can see you know which which regions are using it which applications in different industries uh, you can look at the seeing is believing report they've got a little uh, data explorer here where you can change the years you can change the countries the currencies uh, that you can see the use cases uh, so yeah there's a lot of good stuff um, to check out and this is the soft skills report with a bit more data around it. Uh, but yeah, there's there's loads of material basically. So I'm happy to to take your steer and, and Asher, your steer as well on, on interesting areas to chat about. Um, so is there a link to the uh, grant funding information someone asked or is that not public yet? Yes, no, no, the grant funding information is all public. Um, I'm trying to think if I have it if I have it to hand at the moment, let me see, grant funding. I should have it here. What I'll do is, um, instead of me trying to search for it now, I will get the link because I do have it somewhere. Um, and then I'll make sure we can provide it as part of the uh, the details that go out in a debrief email. Okay, cool. But it's I definitely public. Like all of this information that you saw here uh, is all publicly available. It's just not in this format. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess I'll kind of start with some questions of my own. And if anyone has more, please put your hand up or jump in at any point. The first thing I kind of wanted to ask was about that 1.5 trillion figure that was estimated yeah. in 2019. Do you believe that this could still be the case given the current, current climate? Or do you think COVID has sped up or slowed down adoption? So back in April this year, I was, I, I was wondering about that point because we were getting challenged on it. And I engaged our economics team again to look at the model that they've created um, and given COVID-19, whether the long-term view still stood. Now, the response is that uh, while we've had interruptions to 2019, the short-term views, 2019 to 2021, in terms of the long-term view up to 2030, this is still a reasonable prediction based on the modeling because the effects of COVID-19 are expected to subside by the time it gets to 2030. Gotcha. So uh, yes, the one and a half trillion figure relates to 2030. And so in summary, uh, we expect that number to still be valid as a result. 
And over the over this past year, have you seen more of an increase in in demand from companies that you might not have expected looking to try pilots or experiment the technology or decline? So as it's it's an interesting one because back in March when this all really kicked off in the UK, uh, we initially experienced a decrease. So uh, the lines went dead. Uh, people weren't you know come, uh, asking us about queries. They weren't asking questions. They weren't showing interest. And uh, it was getting quite worrying, actually. Fortunately, about a month and a half later, things started to pick up again, and it led to um, it led to to actually an increase in in interest to the point where it, ex it exceeded pre-COVID levels. Now, my thinking behind why that was is because initially there was a lot of confusion. There was a lot of firefighting, even beyond the day-to-day -day firefighting that a lot of organizations had to do uh, to try and get systems in place to deal with this, to try and uh, work under new ways of working, you know, remotely, um, not able to access, you know, hardware, equipment, or face-to-face or -face contact to get approvals for anything. So all of this was going on for the first month or two, and there's a lot of confusion. But after that, when organizations started to feel that they were in this for the long term, that this would be normality for them, at least uh, for a little bit longer, um, they felt more confident in starting to engage. They got rid of the fires and they started to engage with innovative technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality and were thinking, OK, if this is the new normal. Then how can we optimize that new normal through the use of, of VR, AR? and even non-technological ways of working, to be honest. So in summary, it started off like just uh, dropping to almost uh, almost nothing in terms of inquiries. And then it rose again to exceed levels that uh, that were pre-COVID, in fact. Yeah, we actually had a similar experience with the Merch UK. And uh, funnily, I just I found that companies that I would never have expected to hear from were reaching out, which was, I feel like it generated um, new interest in, in companies I wouldn't have thought would, would reach out really. So that was, that gives me some hope, I think. Um, there's another company, uh, sorry, another question here from George asking, what do you think about social web based VR and the future of the metaverse? I think I, I quite like, um, I really love the idea of social VR, George, and I'm, I'm going to bring this up as well. Actually, if I go back to the contents page here, um, one of the misconceptions that I talk about in the book uh, is that VR is an isolating technology. Absolutely not true at all. Um, and social VR is a great example of why VR is is not just uh, a single single person's uh, or, or, or isolating technology. The fact that you can bring people together and not only just bring them together in the way that the internet has and the way that social media has, uh, but bring them together in such a powerful way that you almost feel or you get as close as possible to feeling like you're actually in the same space, sharing the same experience with someone else. That ability to achieve that level of immersion has never been managed through any medium or any invention that is desktop based. So I'm, I'm all for social VR and I'm all for it to try and uh, quash this misconception that VR is an isolating technology. Um, and in terms of, I guess, the second part of your question, the future of the metaverse, um, I'm not sure it's going to be as as Ready Player One as many of us think it might be. And for those of you who, who can't catch the reference, Ready Player One is, uh, is a book then made into a film by Steven Spielberg, which talks about a, a future where everybody has basically neglected the planet because they're all having such a great time in virtual reality. So everything looks terrible outside, but it doesn't matter because we go back home, put on our VR headset and we learn in virtual reality and we, um, <laughs> You know, we we have fun in virtual reality. We meet in virtual reality. We do everything in VR. I don't think it's going to get to that stage, and it probably shouldn't get to that stage. In all honesty, I think the real world, the real world, if you look for it, has has a lot of beautiful things going on, um, and we shouldn't neglect that. And in fact, virtual reality. This is another misconception. In fact, virtual reality is never going to replace uh, real life experiences, or to put it more accurately, it shouldn't replace real life experiences. Um, so my future is, yes, there may be a metaverse, but it may be more 
MMORPG than, uh, than this all-encompassing world that we move to. MMORPG is a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Uh, <laughs> online games played between, between people on a desktop computer, for those not in the know. Great. Um, actually, off the back of that, I had a question about um, how you showed that product and service development um, could have the greatest yeah. so organizational meetings, design and visualization. So, I mean, we've seen lots of platforms iterating really quickly over the past year to meet demand and changing demand. Um, are there any platforms in particular that stand out to you as doing a really great job? Um, in terms of product and service development, um, I think there are there are quite a few good ones. Um, I'm trying to think of one that is based in the UK to give you uh, uh, a good example of that. Um, I would say, let's talk about Gravity Sketch because Gravity Sketch was on uh, the Augmenter program, uh, which is um, which is an accelerator designed to help promote um, uh, UK VRAR startups, and uh, they've been working with. Ford, the US automobile manufacturer. They've been working with a, um, a Belgian company. Uh, I'm trying to remember their name, Achilles Design. They've been working with, um, uh, there was also another company they've been working with whose names forgets me. But the point is, if we take the Ford example and the Achilles Design example, you've got automotive and industrial design. And effectively what Gravity Sketch is helping them to do is they're helping them to bring uh, organization, these organizations and their teams, different teams within the organization together to look at a one-to-one -one scale item, whether it's a, via a new vehicle that hasn't launched yet, it's being designed, or whether it's a new tool uh, that is being designed, a new bicycle. Um, and they're able to get all of these different stakeholders, the electronics teams, the health and safety teams, the ergonomics teams, the design teams, all together sharing the same space, the same virtual space, even though they're all over the world in, in disparate places, but they're able to come together and feed back on these items, these vehicles, these bicycles, whatever it is. And therefore they're able to, to iterate and speed up the development and the, the push to market um, of these products, because instead of it appearing on a, on a 2D screen and trying to trying to visualize that which is very small on a small laptop screen and say, okay, so that's one-to-one -one scale. It's probably going to be like that. I think we need to change this. Then building it physically in the real world, then potentially flying or, or transporting all these stakeholders together in the same room to see the physical uh, product. You've now got the ability to just everyone put their VR headset on, have a look at it one-to-one -one scale, open the doors, sit in the seats, put your hands on the steering wheel, um, and then go, I need this change, that change, that change. Everyone takes off their headset. Designers go back into their um, uh, their software packages, make changes, and as quickly as a few hours later or the next day, even you could have all of those stakeholders from all over the world put their headsets on again and see the next iteration. So, pretty amazing uh, from a product and service development perspective. Great. Um, I have someone here asking to clarify the numbers you've shared. So, they're saying were these. Yeah any and all XR deployments, so including experiences on a smartphone? And do you think that um, smartphone-based XR experiences are adequately researched and considered in the industry? Um, so if we're talking, are we talking about the seeing is believing numbers? Um, I believe so, yeah. Sorry. So that's all right. Um, so seeing is believing, we definitely, because I had, I had personal conversations with the economics team about this and the, the methodology that sat behind it. Uh, we definitely did include mobile-based um, uh, uh, or smartphone-based XR experiences. And um, uh, the first part of the question relating to any and all XR deployments, including experiences on a smartphone, yes. Do you think that smartphone-based XR experience adequately researched and considered? Um, within the, if you're talking about this report, they have been considered. If we're talking about adequately researched and considered within industry as in organizations thinking about them, I would say yes as well, only because the conversations that I've had, so I, I can speak firsthand with a lot of organizations that are thinking about, let's say augmented reality, because this is probably the, the bigger piece of the pie when we're talking about smartphone based XR experiences. Um, most of those organizations I've spoken to how, want to use smartphone-based or tablet-based ARX handheld, 
based AR experiences versus headset based. In fact, I'd be as confident as to say it's probably about 80%, 20%, if not more, in favor of smartphone based AR experiences versus head mounted displays currently. That's currently because of the, the costs associated with it and because of the complexities associated with it. Now, there are serious advantages to be had by using head mounted displays from an augmented reality perspective. Um, but we're only likely to see that effort being accepted on a more wider basis once the cost comes down and the return on investment business case becomes more effective. This feeds into someone else's question, I think, of what do you make, they ask, what do you make of Google's abandonment of Google Cardboard platform, which has, has the potential to make VR more accessible to people around the world with smartphones? Uh, Google, Google Cardboard is a really tough one. Um, it is controversial. So actually, do I have it here? Let's see. Yes, here we go. <laughs> so Google Cardboard is controversial. I'm, I'm literally just going to read out this paragraph here. Uh, per its name, it's made almost entirely out of cardboard. It is inexpensive, able to be branded, accepts a variety of smartphones and is easily transported as it can be flat packed. It spread far and wide and was an entry point into VR for many, but it had significant limitations. It suffered from low quality content, was not durable, had only a single mechanical button for input, needed to be held up by the user and produced substandard visual results compared with many other headsets. Um, however, these limitations don't preclude it from being used in organizations if the application is fitting. Now, let me get you to the application very quickly, if I can. Yes, here we go. So uh, case study here, which uses a Google Cardboard in particular, and this is a British company that led this, by the way, called uh, Gorilla in the Room. I don't know if, you, if any of you have heard them, but they're um, immersive research specialist company. And they worked with O2, to use immersive technologies, virtual reality in particular in this case, to research consumer behaviors. So if you think about what research organizations have to do, they identify a population, a nice you know, diverse population um, of whatever it is, 100, 200 people. Um, in this case, it was 400 people. Deliver them information and then ask them uh, for uh, for their views on that information or that you know that branding or whatever it is, so Gorilla in the Room sent out Google Cardboards to all 400 of these people and integrated a virtual reality 360 video experience of in this case different O2 stores to get their opinion on how on on the effectiveness of those O2 stores. So the idea would be you as an individual are being asked to fill in your survey as you would usually do on your mobile phone. So you're going, you're, you're, you're clicking away and then all of a sudden it says, okay, for the next question, we need you to put your virtual reality phone into your Google Cardboard viewer. So you click it, you put it into the viewer, you put it on your, against your face, you look around for only 30 seconds or so. And this is key as to why Google Cardboard was the right application here. And uh, you look around and then you answer the question about that uh, that particular uh, environment that you saw, the O2 store that you saw. Um, and there's different ones here that were given to the different users. Now, the reason Google Card was, fan was fantastic for that, uh, that um, business use case is because first of all, large number of people based all over the place that need to have access to it. So we need something that is low cost. Uh, we need something that doesn't necessarily need to be returned to us because imagine dealing with logistics, not only to the location, but back again, insurance costs, everything really, really adds up. And especially once you get to 400 people, it's, it makes a big difference. But Google Cardboard can be branded in your own branding. It can be scaled up really easily, costs only a few pounds at scale to deliver, and you don't have to worry about getting it back. Users are only 30 seconds in that environment, so they don't actually have to worry about um, you know, needing to uh, to use controllers, you know, you just need to look around. Uh, they don't need to worry about spending 20 minutes holding, uh, you know, a headset up to your face. So that's fine. So to summarize an answer, it's a very long answer, but to summarize it to your question, even though Google, Google Cardboard's, um, Google's abandoned the Google Cardboard platform, it is still useful and it's still made open source. So it's not completely dead. And in fact, this use case, I believe is only it's only about two years old, if I remember correctly. So 
this is still being used in industry, but you have to be very careful about what the right use cases are given the limitations of such a platform. Now, the potential to people around the world, yes, but it is a double-edged sword at the same time. Uh, so I'm just gonna bring this up very quickly for you. Sorry, I keep jumping between stuff because the information's in different areas. But there are four main obstacles to, to virtual reality adoption around the world. And here, these are the four. Education is the one I wanna talk about in relation to this answer. Um, yes, more people have become educated about virtual reality as a result of Google Cardboard adoption. However, when you ask the question to people, have you tried a virtual reality experience? They may answer, lots of people may answer yes, but those yeses are not equal. Some yeses may be related to a roller coaster experience that they tried on for 20 seconds in Google Cardboard a year ago. Some of them may be related to some cutting edge enterprise usage using volumetric video on a standalone headset only a week ago. And those two experiences have very different ramifications for what the users understand to be the value of the technology. So I'm, my conclusion on it is, is that it's a bit mixed. It's been great in terms of getting the message out there, but now we have the responsibility as a VR industry to try and take that, that understanding, that sort of level one understanding. I've heard of VR and I've tried something that I thought was VR too. VR as a concept is a spectrum. It has many different experiences. It has lots of different content, uh, 360 video, computer generated, volumetric. And I need to understand the, that and how far it can go. I know how, I know where it starts from, but I need to know where it ends. So part of our, our ability to educate others will be around that. It's now on us to take them to the next step, in other words. Sorry about this. This is my neighbor's cat, by the way. It's not even mine. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Um, there's a question here that ties into a question I also had that asks about what kind of time frame would you be looking at between a company showing interest in VR and AR and finally implementing their technology? Kind of ties into my question, which was around in your new book, where you talk about the five phases of XR implementation. So maybe yeah. you can tie Absolutely. both together um, and, yeah. and how long it usually takes for this whole process. Sure. Um, so let me just go to that section, page 74. So if you think about an XR project, it's always going to begin its life at the discover stage. So in other words, this is when stakeholders are researching the technology, they're trying to understand it, very much the education piece that I was talking about. They want to see where it potentially fits within their organization before investing in the next stage, which is around actually designing a solution, uh, not only from a software perspective, but from a deployment perspective uh, as well. Then you've got the software development, which contrary to a lot of people's beliefs is actually a fairly small part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the XR implementation workflow here. And then you've got the deployment. This relates to the change management, the stakeholder management, and then finally debriefing, understanding how effective was that implementation, looking at the data that's been collected and then forming a view on what needs to change and whether the, uh, the use of the technology was uh, was valuable in the first place. Um, so in terms of how long it would take to get from there to there, um, I mean, we've had, we've had projects that have concluded end to end within, I'd say the shortest time period has been probably four months. Um, and the longest time period, I can think of projects that are you know, one year plus still and uh, are not at that stage. So I think it's quite, it's quite ranging and it depends on the, it depends on the appetite of the company. It depends on the appetite of the individuals you speak to. It depends on their, their sort of availability. It depends on the resources they have uh, to be able to put into this. It depends on how you sell it as well, because if you sell it as uh, this is a multi-million pound project, it's going to change everything and we need you to invest. That's going to be far more difficult and far longer to get over the line than look, we think this is valuable. We think it could be a multi-million pound trans digital transformation program in two years time. However, right now, let's take one of your teams and let's create a very small application that maybe has, uh, you know, uh, a fifth of the, the scope of what a 
a full ranging um, application would be. And let's test it on that on that small team. And for a very small price, let's pilot this program. Let's get the analysis from it. And then let's use the results as a business case. So if you sell it like that, you can get much, uh, much quicker results. And in fact, it's 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 a double win because you get quicker results, but you also potentially get a business case to help you fund the larger project as well. Absolutely. Um, there's another great question here about acting, but the biz biggest risks that you see um, that could derail uh, growth expectations for XR, for example, cloud computing, cloud rendering, improvements to AI, et cetera. Um, derail, I think by derail has a very negative connotation, whereas the, the things you're talking about could, uh, could help improve those expectations further. So the Yes, there may be improvements on the number that we already have. Um, I agree with that. Uh, and I don't think that's a negative thing. I think, uh, I think the, num the number is already big enough to show that this is important. At the end of the day, one and a half trillion dollars is not, is not something that we're going to look at in 2030 and go, right, actually, it was, it was 2.396. It wasn't 1.5. Um, the point of it is to show that if we take a conservative view of the, uh, the impact of these technologies based on what we know right now, then it could have such tremendous impact. If we have, our, if we have technologies like cloud computing, cloud rendering um, improvements and, uh, and things like that, that take this even further, then that's absolutely fantastic. And that bolsters the um, the the message, the key message behind these numbers, which is even more important, that virtual reality and augmented reality can improve productivity in the world and can boost GDP. Because a company, an organization is going to look at this and they're not going to say, okay, but can it go even can it go even further? If they're happy enough that it has this potential to boost GDP and productivity, they are happy to invest. And that's really the idea behind the large number. Okay. We have another question here asking like, how much do you think the need for affordability and accessibility limits the feasible potential of integrating haptics into XR experiences? So it's, let me just go back to uh, your points. Was it affordability and feasibility? Uh, yeah, and accessibility, yeah. Okay, so affordability is always gonna be there um, unless you're really talking about niche uh, niche use cases. So for example, uh, I don't actually have this to hand, but we'll probably get this up pretty quickly. Um, there's a, I think it was Honda, uh, Honda that was using a uh, haptics technology. Uh, it was an ultra leap. Uh, no, I can't find it here. Uh, basically we had a, we had a vendor come to us. Um, uh, oops, let me go back to that. Where is it? We had a vendor come to the PwC office, um, a haptics vendor, and, I, and their name is, is escaping me now, which is, which is pretty bad. They're a pretty significant haptics vendor, um, and they had uh, effectively a glove, and they used, they used air bubbles on the, um, uh, on the glove itself and a compressor. So there was an SDK, uh, a software development integration, into, into Unity. So every time you touch something like... Uh, in this case, the example I was thinking of, a, a steering wheel for Honda uh, with your hands with the gloves on, the compressor would very quickly uh, push air into the bubbles that were touching, that were related to the, to the part of the hand that was touching the steering wheel in virtual reality. Now, the, that's absolutely fantastic. And the, the, the feeling was incredible, um, but it was quite expensive. So for someone like Honda, it's within the realm of possibility for them. But, we, but not within the realm of the average consumer. Mm -hmm. So I think affordability definitely has a, a key to play and that relates to accessibility as well. Um, the other aspect around feasibility, so this, this connects to uh, the user experience point um, that, was to, that um, I very briefly brought up here. For virtual reality and augmented reality technology to be useful and to be adopted uh, mainstream in the world, it really has to, it has to be easy to use. It has to be intuitive to use without having to onboard anyone. Um, so in the same way that we can take a mobile phone out of its packaging and just start using it really, 
we need to get to that stage with virtual reality and augmented reality technology. And we're definitely not there yet. Um, haptics, because of the complications that are associated with the technology, you think about the, the, the compressor that needs to be set up and connected to the glove, um, the glove that needs to then be integrated with the software, uh, the headset that then goes on and then uh, the software may, uh, connects with the glove. All this sort of stuff is far more complicated than most consumers are willing uh, to play uh, with uh, or, or to mess around with. So if you look at consumer headsets right now, like the Oculus Quest 2, for example, um, the HTC uh, Focus Plus, things like that, they've all got they're all designed to be, they're standalone first of all, so they don't have sensors around the place. Uh, they don't need to be connected to a computer, display port, USB, uh, thunder, Thunderbolt. Uh, it's just put on, controllers out, nice sort of tutorial in the world ready to use. We need to get to that place with a lot of this technology and it's not quite there from a deep haptics perspective. Someone actually asked if you think that more companies will follow in the, these footsteps of, you know, the Oculus Quest and make more hand, standalone devices or will they stick to tethered headsets? I think in, in all honesty, PwC, uh, we're, all, we're moving most things to standalone where possible. So um, from my perspective in my team, it's standalone by default, tethered by exception. Yeah. Um, and I, ex I expect many other organizations are, are doing are, are adopting that same policy right now or will do. And the reason for that, again, it's about user experience. It's about how easy it is to use. Um, it's about how expensive it is, because being standalone versus being tethered, it does affect the not only the cost, but the complexity of the system, the time it takes to set up the number of problems you might have because of the links in the chain of the system. Um, so, yes, the summary to that question is standalone by default, uh, tethered by exception. Great. Um, and because we, we're kind of coming down to the last uh, minutes of, of, of the, the chat, I, I have some questions more about the, the landscape um, uh, in the UK. You, you said yeah. that percent of usage um, of XR solutions is in London. Which other cities would you consider hubs outside of London? Um, not necessarily begins with cities. So um, I would consider, in terms of cities, I'd consider Bristol um, to be a hub. I'd consider um, Manchester um, to be a hub. Um, and I'm probably, I'm probably going to miss out a few cities, so apologies uh, if I do. Um, I'm just going off uh, what I've got in my head at the moment. Leeds, I would consider um, a hub. Uh, I know they've got a lot of XR activity going on there, particularly with the University uh, of Leeds. I would consider Portsmouth um, could very well become a hub, particularly with the investment that uh, they're making and the, the collaboration with, uh, with UK government uh, to set up uh, centers of excellence over there. Um, yeah, so th those are the uh, many of the key ones, I'd say. That actually feeds into my next question around investment into centers of excellence that are happening around the country. So you mentioned Portsmouth, um, there's also yeah. 46 million going into Bristol and Bath. Um, Gateshead Council is, is looking into creating a Newcastle. That's another one. Newcastle. They're trying to do a national innovation center uh, in Gates in Gateshead to complement Proto, which is already up there. Um, you know, so there's there's pockets of of stuff happening all over the country. What kind of recommendations would you give to those centers and people have that money to invest in their regions to try and you know uh, accelerate adoption in that area? I think um, it's, it's related to what I said before in that if they have a center of excellence that contains a lot of the higher end equipment and applications and curated in such a way that it could be made available to members of the public, then it should be made available ideally to members of the public and key stakeholders within industry and within academia um, and within government, because this education point is really key. A lot of people now have heard of virtual reality and augmented reality and maybe have had a basic experience to do with it, but we've got to take them to the next level now. We've got to get them really understanding about how far this technology can go and how far it can help in solving a lot of business problems, uh, as well as enhancing our, our personal lives on top of that. Great. We have another question here as well from the audience just asking what VR development tools do you use and what new tools are you the most excited about? 
Uh, what VR development tools? I'm most excited about volumetric video. And this is, I suppose it's a bit of a cheat answer to the question, but I could consider uh, some of the tool sets that Microsoft's put out there to support volumetric, their volumetric video algorithm um, within that. So volumetric video is a technology that we actually used on a very recent PwC project to do with diversity and inclusion training. And uh, we've got it running on standalone headsets like the Oculus Quest, uh, which is fantastic. So for those of you who don't know, volumetric video, uh, oh, actually this is a, a good excuse to go back into the book. Uh, there's a section on this. I promise you this is, this is not just me majorly plugging it. There's some actually useful information in here. Um, volumetric video, uh, the best of both worlds. Yeah, here we go, right. So this is a picture of me in Dimension Studio in London which uses, which is a volumetric capture studio uh, that actually is connected to Newcastle because Hammerhead VR are a, 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 a stakeholder in this joint venture with Microsoft and Digital Catapult uh, in this volumetric capture studio and they're based in Newcastle. Um, so this is me in the Dimension Studio on the left and on the right is my volumetric capture in Unity. So an actual, th the best way to think about this is a 3D video effectively. So it is a 3D model, it's an animated 3D model, um, but it's got a video texture applied to it. And it just looks, it looks absolutely brilliant from a, from a virtual reality perspective because it gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you super realistic um, sort of, you know, 3D modeling and, you know, facial animation, because it's basically a video of, of, of my face and my hands and my, 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 my uh, attire and everything. Um, and it doesn't need to be animated manually. So it's all captured like a video, but it's like a three dimensional video. So you still get the six degrees of freedom. So the ability to like look around and like uh, see, see the model from different perspectives, but also get that sense of realism. And it can be managed to such an extent that you can get it running on fairly low power hardware, um, like you know these standalone headsets that are out there. So I'm very excited about that. Nice. Um, something else I want to bring up is, you know, we've seen a lot of great success from government programs like Audience of the Future, for example, we see funding and creative clusters around the country. If I told you tomorrow that the government would fund your dream program to continue pushing the industry forward, where would you like to see the money go and why? Oh, this actually is, is directly related to what we were just talking about. Um, I would love to see them fund volumetric capture to the extent that it becomes far more um, far more affordable and far more portable accessible um, so right now you you basically either need to go to a studio physically with all of your assets or your people uh, or they you know dimensions got a, a service now and, and other people have got it as well where they bring a truck to you you know where they set up this studio with you know, the, the hundreds of cameras around you, the RGB and the depths, RGB cameras and depth cameras. Um, but the problem is it's a very involved process involving a hell of a lot of equipment. And if we can miniaturize that and make it more affordable and make it portable, imagine the types of content we could create that brings together the best of both worlds. It brings together the best of 360 video and the best of computer generated content to, to give us this world that is, that is as immersive as it's going to get basically without being in the real world i would fund something that helps achieve that objective someone is asking about um what are the needs for more sensory devices such as smell and vr can we miniaturize <laughs> like that as well so it's multi-sensory yeah to be to be honest with you um smell smell can be miniaturized it's it's just not particularly it's not a particularly elegant uh, solution right now. So I've tried some of these some of these uh, devices. It's literally like a little tabletop device, probably a little bit bigger than my mobile phone and, and obviously bulkier. And the idea is you put these little discs in it. So you put a disc in and it basically uh, takes the scent out of that disc and then a fan blows it in your face. And you can get it to integrate with, you know, your Unity or Unreal software and get it to blow it in your face at the right time. Um, and I've seen some attempts to put it into a headset as well, but it's just really, it's quite finicky and it's quite clumsy and cumbersome. And I'm not sure people 
get enough value out of it yet, especially when there are um, there are arguably you, we still need to tackle sight and sound and get that really nailed down. I think before we start looking at the other senses, I'm sure that will become more on people's radar once we once we once we've managed affordability and accessibility from a sight and and sound perspective. But for now, I think it's it's languishing in the background to some extent, except where you might see it in more standalone installations where they know they've got people uh, in a particular location and they've got experiences just cycling every 30 minutes and they know when to spray it at the right time. There's two, two people I would signpost uh, everyone to though. Um, I believe Charlotte Mickelberg, who's a Acad Academy Award, <laughs> she's an award-winning VR uh, director and producer. She um, is working on a um, multi-sensory mobile AR based ex, uh, experience. So she might be someone to like watch out for, to see what comes of that. Um, and also Grace Boyle from the Feelies. She does um, a lot of multi-sensory work. So that, that work is really interesting to look at. By the way, this is the example. Sorry, I messed it up. It wasn't Honda, it was Nissan. <laughs> and uh, the company is called Haptex. So these are the guys that came over to the office. They're, they're, there's their glove there. Um, and it actually, so as they're pressing the, the screen there, you can see their thing, you'll get a, um, a feel on their finger um, that will uh, that will give them some very powerful feedback there. And they brought this to PwC to try? How do I get my hands on this? Yeah, yeah, we were quite lucky. Um, they were doing a, a, U, a UK tour. Um, so they, they came over with the, with the compressor, with the headset, with the computer, the gloves and everything. Very, <laughs> very cool. Um, so, you know, we're kind of running over time, Jeremy, so we'll have to unfortunately wrap up. I know we could kind of talk about this all day. Um, no you, worries. This is a, an open, ongoing kind of uh, interactive mapping that you're doing, right? So companies can still get involved. If you, have, if you want to mention that to people. Absolutely. Yeah. So companies can still get involved um, if I open up the map here. So you can get that from XR and pwc.co.uk slash XR and industry. Um, and at the bottom of that page, you can actually submit your own examples uh, because this was based on publicly available data. So if you have anything that you want included in this map that is not publicly available, uh, drop it into this list. And our aim is to keep this updated. And eventually, if we can, to make it a global map, we've got UK and US now. Uh, currently, UK is available publicly. Um, US is available behind the scenes. So you can see you can get a little sneak peek here. Uh, behind the scenes of the US data as well and everything that sits behind it. Um, but yeah, we want to make this global if we can. So um, do let us know if you have anything you want to contribute to that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for your time. That was really, really insightful. I hope everyone um, got some, some useful info from it. Uh, we're going to be sending out um, all of the links that have kind of been in the chat and um, any further information from, from Jeremy um, in, in a follow-up email. So, And please feel free to reach out to either of us um, if you have any, any further questions. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, everyone. And thanks, Asher, um, Anita. Uh, Anna Marie and the rest of the uh, the Immerse UK team. It's been uh, it's been a real pleasure. Right, thanks so much, Jeremy. Thanks a lot, everyone. Cheers. Bye, guys.